It's a bright summer's day in Marlborough, and there's a party going on. It's the annual multicultural festival, and it's a celebration of 21st century Marlborough and the diverse people who now call this place home. The waves of the Pacific have been pounding on this coastline for millions of years, but it's only in the last thousand years that the first immigrants have arrived, the Tangata Whenua. Since then, waves of migrants have come to the Wairau. They've brought with them their dreams, their culture, and their memories of home. All of the things which have made Marlborough what it is today. Here is a glimpse of their story. Okay, Puta Te Waito is a proverb that's synonymous with the Waito, and particularly this place, the Waito Bar. It means the sun always shines here. And Waito is a place that means the hundred waters. It's the reason my tūpuna arrived here and settled. So they had travelled through the Pacific and they finally found this beautiful place here in Aotearoa. And it's the first landing place of humans in Aotearoa. <laughs> Those first migrants arrived from Eastern Polynesia around 1250 AD. Their stories recorded in legend and place names throughout the area. For 200 years, they hunted the giant moa as a source of feathers, food and eggs, until sadly that unique bird became extinct. Other tribes began to migrate to the area, attracted by its rich food resources and prized minerals like argillite. North Island tribe Ngāti Kuia migrated to Te Hoieri, Peloris Sound, while Ngāti Apa sailed to Tōtaranui, Queen Charlotte Sound. Rangitane came from the Manawatū and settled on the Wairau, where they built extensive canals and waterways to harvest eels and bird life. These times were generally peaceful thanks to tribal intermarriage and plentiful food though occasional incursions from the south by Naitahu would be forcefully driven back. 500 years after the first arrivals, English explorer James Cook and his crews arrived in Tōtoranui. Their white faces intrigued the locals, but the relationship generally went well and Cook returned several times to repair his ships and replenish supplies. It was another 50 years before other Europeans arrived. Frenchman Derville and Russian explorer Bellingshausen. The Russian ship's artists sketched various friendly encounters around Tōtaranui, and Bellingshausen recorded that Little Waikawa Bay now seemed to be the main sound settlement. Not long after the Russians left, disaster struck the people of Teto Ihu. An alliance of North Island tribes, led by warrior chief Taropiraha, crossed the strait with their newly acquired muskets. The locals had little chance against these new weapons and were soon scattered in hiding as the invaders occupied their lands. It was a turbulent time for the region, the impact of which echoes to this day. time my tūpuna came and lived here, lots of other people have come to live here as well. And one of those was a particular woman, a special woman, who came to live here. She raised her family here. She was a gardener and a publican and a farmer and a nurse. And her name was Betty Gard. And she probably is most well known because she was the mother of the first white child to be born in the South Island. 
Betty was just 15 years old and living in Sydney when she met John Gard, a former convict turned sealer and whaler. Jackie Gard, as he was known, had been whaling in Cloudy Bay and took Betty there on his ship Waterloo. He had a whaling base at Tawaiti in the Tory Channel and it was here that Betty gave birth to that first white child, John Gard. She was tended by Māori midwives, the only other women in the area. The whaling operation then moved to Kākāpō Bay in Port Underwood, which was closer to the whale's migration route. In those days, of course, it was all very, very basic. No power, no water supply, apart from there was a good creek. But they only lived in a one-room house and a clay floor. And, and through the whaling season in the winter, I don't know how she survived. <laughs> It was a tough time for the new migrants as ongoing battles between Ngāti Toa from the north and Naitahu in the south raged up and down the east coast. But Captain Jackie kept an uneasy friendship with Ngāti Toa chief Taruparaha and managed to get plenty of flax and whale oil to sell back in Sydney. It was after one of those trips to Sydney in 1834 that the most traumatic events befell Betty. On the journey back, their ship, Harriet, was wrecked on the Taranaki coast near Oponaki. Betty and all on board made it safely ashore, but a fight broke out with the local Ngāti Ruanui. A dozen sailors were killed, and Betty, along with her two small children, was taken captive. These events later inspired an acclaimed novel, The Captive Wife, by renowned author Fiona Kidman. My book was inspired by the courage and abilities of this remarkable pioneer woman. She had eight children in all, but none of her many descendants would be here today, but for one thing. When a Maori warrior struck his mere to Betty's head on the Taranaki shore, the blow was deflected by this, a solid tortoiseshell comb she had in her hair. It saved her life, but some of the teeth remained embedded in her skull for the rest of her life. The rest of the comb was saved to end up as a most unique artefact here at the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa. Jackie Gard and the surviving sailors rowed all the way back to Port Underwood and Jackie caught a ship to Sydney. There he persuaded Governor Richard Bork to rescue his wife and children and two frigates were dispatched to Taranaki. Thomas Waugh was aboard the HMS Alligator and sketched the action as the soldiers rowed ashore. They dragged two cannons inland and bombarded the hilltop pa, driving Ngāti Ruanui into the bush. Betty and her two children were rescued, young John being wrenched from the back of Chief Oa Iti, who was then controversially shot dead with many of his warriors. The loss of life worried both European and Māori, and hastened efforts to reach a more peaceful arrangement, which happened six years later when the Treaty of Waitangi was signed. <laughs> Betty and Jackie went back to Sydney, where she became something of a celebrity because of her remarkable adventures. But New Zealand had taken a hold on them both, and in February 1836 they left Sydney for the last time and went back to Kākāpō Bay. Here at Kākāpō Bay, I can look at the stars every night of my life, at the sea and at all the teeming life of this bay. My bones will be laid in this soil. Betty's bones do lay in the soil of Kākāpō Bay, along with generations of her guard descendants. And she will forever hold a special place in our migrant history as the first white woman who chose to settle in Marlborough and live the rest of her days here. Betty Gard was the first guard woman to live at Kakapo Bay. And now, nearly 200 years later, it appears I'll be the last guard woman to live at Kakapo Bay.
The Tory and many other immigrant ships began arriving from Britain, bringing people of every trade eager to build a new life on the other side of the world. The wide, flat plains of the Wairo offered space to grow, and many took the chance to acquire land there by fair means or sometimes foul. In 1843, the Wairau Plain was in much dispute. By 1847, it was purchased by Governor Gray on behalf of the Crown. My forebears were poor farm labourers from the south of England, and they came out with the Nelson settlement in 1842. My grandfather became a blade shearer and moved over here in the mid-1850s. When the Wakamarina gold rush occurred, my grandfather was able to go there and win enough gold to come back and purchase a property on the lower Wairau Plain and establish our farm there. The Wairau has experienced all the elements of New Zealand's human history, from moa hunter to Maori, from missionary to musket wars, immigration, settlement and social change. The Edwin Fox here in Picton is New Zealand's most famous and only surviving immigrant ship. But curiously enough, the Edwin Fox never actually brought any immigrants to Picton. Only one ship ever did that. And we are all descendants of young John Leslie who came on it. And what was that ship, kids? The Canadian! Yay! The Carnatic left London in September 1874, heading directly to Picton, the only ship to do so. On board were almost 200 new migrants for Marlborough, plus another 100 bound for Wellington. Among them was 15-year-old Lavinia Bristow, who kept a diary of her lengthy voyage. It didn't start very well. It was very rough in the afternoon and we were dreadfully sick, so we had to stay downstairs. We all laid on the ground like a parcel of pigs, such a day I shall never forget if I live to be a hundred years old. But her seasickness passed and Lavinia soon cheered up. About seven, the captain sent the fiddler up to play us some tunes so as we could have a dance. It was a grand ball, a beautiful moonlit night. We danced till about 10 o'clock. It was a long journey through the Southern Ocean and everyone was pleased to sight land again. We have been on board 103 days and are only going five miles an hour. One of the girls said that at this rate, by the time we get to New Zealand, it will be Old Zealand. At five o'clock we came in sight of Picton. We were all so disappointed. It looked like such a little place and nothing but mountains all around us. This afternoon we heard news to say that we must leave the ship and land at Picton. We are sorry to land at Picton, but we wanted to go to Wellington. Lavinia and her family did go on to Wellington, but 197 others left the Carnatic at Picton and began a new life in Marlborough, where many of their descendants remain to this day. By 1848, pastoral farmers from the Nelson area were coming over here and establishing fine wool producing stations in this Wairau Valley and also in the Arbitrary Valley. The Arbitrary farmers had to go around the boulder bank, around the bluff and the five miles down here to unload wool. The Wairau farmers had to follow around these foothills, get on the boulder bank and come down. The European settlement was a series of hotels, wool stores and wharves. Now where we are standing at the moment was the site of Francis MacDonald's two-storey Cobb Hotel and as we look to our right was Budge's House and Store and where the trees finish on our left over here to the eastern side was Peel's Hotel. So there was the little village here catering for the needs of bullock drivers and also seamen who were very, very thirsty on many occasions. And so some of these hotels 
got rather a bad name for giving alcohol or to selling alcohol and uh, having some trouble with the law. This settlement here really became, in effect, the capital of the Wairau area. But in the mid-1850s, there was another massive earthquake which allowed shipping to go as far as a village called the Beaver, 12 miles up the Apawa River. And all we see today is the mounds where these hotels were. And so it is a significant area, but it's largely a forgotten capital of the Wairau. The immigrants brought many new ideas. The women especially wanted social change, and one of the strongest advocates for social change lived right here in Blenheim. Mary Muller, who was commemorated on this tapestry, wrote extensively on women's rights under the pseudonym Femina and greatly influenced public opinion of the time. When New Zealand women did eventually get the vote in 1893, Kate Shepherd herself acknowledged our Mary as the pioneer suffragette. Mary was followed by generations of Marlborough women finding their own way to stand tall. The eight Fulton sisters worked on the family flax farm at Bohawley. Only one married, and they all enjoyed the lively Blenheim social scene. The youngest, Wilhelmina, trained as a nurse and was later matron at Wairau Hospital. Women could now vote but the effects of war and isolation often left them with many extra responsibilities, especially on the farm. Many stepped up to run rural and urban businesses. Selena Terrell supported her family with a commercial boarding establishment, Panama House. Kate Cullen came from Ireland and opened a drapery business on Market Street. Ellen Doherty became the first New Zealand registered nurse, medal number one. And in 1919, Ada Redwood became Blenheim's first elected women councillor, holding her seat for 60 years. Eng Bickling Fong came from China and worked on her family's orchard while attending Rapara School and Marlborough Girls College. She later wrote a university thesis and successful book reflecting on life for Chinese migrants in their new home. Pauline Bennett flew high at the Marlborough Aero Club as New Zealand's first female flying instructor. And Seddon woman Mary Watson ran a unique travelling electric washer service from her motorcycle, riding rural roads to do the weekly wash on backcountry farms. Times have changed, but Marlborough women today follow in their pioneering sisters' footsteps. You know, the nurses actually are the clinical managers or the facility managers of a lot of rest homes, if not all, you know, uh, rest homes here in, in Marlborough. So it's really that, you know, caring nature of Filipinos. It's part of our DNA, it's part of our culture that we do do take care of elders and, and pretty much, you know, everybody. Since I got the role on the clubs of Marlborough, I decided, well, I might be the first, but there has to be someone to start. Rather than to be a restaurant French cuisine or a restaurant Italian cuisine, I'm going to bring all these cuisines and make them in one place. So I come up with the idea, which is a cuisine night. So for my lovely, amazing people who I feel with them connected more than just uh, customers or clients. I, I feel they are my home, eating my food. And then you got the right to help with it. There is a papadom, which is a very oriental things with the Indian food, just as a munch with a sauce. I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you so much. Enjoy. So every time they come, I give them a cuisine. I can see the happiness in their eyes. I can see the clapping, the cuddles I get. It's beyond just eating food. Like 
I love Sailinge. In Brazil, I worked for seven years on people there because when I come in New Zealand, I feel deaf <laughs> because I don't speak. People, tick, 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 English, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, but it's, I, I, I love the Sailinge from help the people deaf. Yeah. I have background of hospitality in the five-star hotel. So when I came over, I got to know Iko. She asked me if I wanted to work with her at the Bamboo Garden. I love hospitality job. I love to say hello to people, you know, be friendly, because to do hospitality, you represent yourself because you sell food. And, and I'm happy when people come to the restaurant and enjoy their food. I can't imagine myself living at the places my husband said, shall we go back and live at my hometown? I said, no way, because I love it here. I love people here. I feel like I fit in here, you know, because I love people in this town. Here you are, coffee martini. Enjoy. This little locomotive is called Aunt Sally, and from 1885, it hauled logs to William Brownlee's sawmill at Black Ball, about five miles west of here, from the forests of the Polaris Valley. Brownlee had emigrated from Scotland and arrived in Mahakapawa in 1864. He built over 15 miles of railway, culverts, and bridges to connect to the wharf at Black Ball. Brownlee brought a sawmill with him and embraced the power of steam. Over the next 50 years, he built a sawmilling empire and was known as the king of sawmilling. This locomotive, Aunt Sally, was one of his. Aunt Sally now rests in front of the Havelock Museum. This was built in 1899 as the Methodist Church, and as the foundation stone records, was opened by my great-great-grandfather, the Reverend John Orchard. The Chinese came to Marlborough as well, and they brought their work ethic and horticultural skills to establish market gardens and other businesses. In 1900, Pin Shek Yi and family established the Chong Li Fruit Shop on Market Street, proudly advertising as the cheapest shop in town. Chan Bing Tai, known as Charles Bing, set up his fruit shop in Market Street in 1938. He and wife Ping Soon had seven children, who all helped in the business. Eldest son Ian Bing later made history as New Zealand's only Chinese publican when he took over the old Clarendon Hotel in Picton, now the well-known Crow Tavern. A recent plaque and sculpture commemorates Ian's achievements. Another son, Graham, eventually sold their fruit shop and established Bing's Motel, one of Blenheim's earliest. Leonard Wong and his friend Ng Ting Fong ran another Market Street fruit shop, while their wives supervised many local workers at the Rapora Apple Orchard. They then bought a farm near Renwick and brought their friend Pak Lim from Gisborne to run it. Pak Lim's farm supplied fruit, eggs and vegetables for his brother-in-law Jack Lowe to sell from his travelling country store and later from Jack's Queen Street shop. For most Chinese, the whole family would help in the business, and it was usually a lot of work. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, my families uh, in those days, they own a fruit shop and also a market garden. If you just have a fruit shop, you only work five and a half day. Saturday, you start to have half a day off, and Sunday, you have a day off. But if you work in the garden, 
yeah, unless there's a lot of job have to be done, you can have a couple of days off a week. But if you have the market garden as well as a fruit shop, you never have a day off. <laughs> so I said, gee, <laughs> there must be an easier way to make a living. <laughs> So I got my commercial pilot license and then I got my airline license and uh, managed to get a job with Safe Air, flying Bristol uh, and then later on on the Argosy. Oh, it was a big deal then. <laughs> yeah. The Chinese immigrants are celebrated in various place names around Marlborough and one is remembered in a special way here at St Luke's Church in Spring Creek. This beautiful eagle lectern was carved for the Anglican community in 1890 by celebrated carver and furniture maker William R. G. William was born Jung Dai Yi in Canton province and was one of the earliest of the Chinese settlers to settle in New Zealand. His work endures in carvings, tombstones and in museum collections including Te Papa and Marlborough Museum. And right here in Spring Creek we have one of his most exquisite works, this beautiful eagle lectern. The vineyards of Marlborough now stretch as far as the eye can see, over thousands of hectares. This stupendous growth all started in 1973 when Montana planted their first grapes down there in the Brancot Valley. But long before that, in 1898, a man from Lebanon emigrated to Marlborough and planted his own small but successful vineyard. That man was my grandfather, Mansour Peters, and he could see the potential of Marlborough and thought it was the perfect place to grow grapes. And that was 70 years before Montana figured out the same thing. My grandfather Mansour sold wine from his Main Street General Store until the 1950s, but he was not the first migrant to make wine in Marlborough. David Heard from Scotland had planted grapes in his aunt's field at Fairhall. He made good wine for many years and built an earth cellar to store it in. That cellar still exists and Pioneer David stands on it in bronze at our region's airport. 100 years later, another visionary migrant saw the potential of Marlborough and quietly purchased a large amount of farmland in the Brancott Valley. That then became one of the largest vineyards in New Zealand, something like 464 acres. It was quite a big thing for Marlborough to suddenly have this huge land sale take place. The, the nervousness of, of, my God, what's happening to, to Marlborough? Are we being taken over by these things called grapes? That man was Frank Jukic from Croatia, and he planted the first grapes there on the 24th of August, 1973. That vineyard became the Montana Estate and sparked the huge growth of viticulture on the Wairau and Awateri Plains. Frank's pioneering work was later recognised in the Queen's Honours and with the very first Marlborough Civic Award in 1990. This has resulted in Marlborough being recognised as one of the world's great wine regions. Frank, it would be my pleasure if you'd come up and accept this. Marlborough wine is now a world-renowned industry which dominates the region's economy. Visionary and hard-working migrants have played a huge part in its success and they continue to do so. It's something that you just dream of. Since uh, in Germany the, the wine regions are established, the wine regions are set rules are set, everything is very rigid and traditional and um, any changes take a generation. And here in New Zealand we can set the rules. Albert Lorenz probably makes the finest wine in Marlborough. <laughs> oh, this bad. What was his name? <laughs> These are our young vines. This is our Pinot Noir that we just planted in August and we um, are singling down. This crew has about nine days to single down about 30,000 plants. Even though we have this 10 generations of experience in Sancerre, we're newcomers here and, and we want to learn from you. The Michelle family emigrated from Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean and saw Marlborough as complementary to their French operation. 
I came first here, and that was in 95. And, you know, it didn't take very long to convince me about the potential of this region. Perfect condition, soil condition, climate condition to grow vines and make quality wines. It's more freedom. You can choose whatever variety you want to produce. You can adapt your production to uh, what consumers want. And that's, that's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, facility you know, for, for producers. Another Marlborough winemaker with a foreign heritage is Irishman Ernie Hunter. He's been very successful in Marlborough. Well, since the success of her first vintage, Olmet, the winemaker, fell in love with New Zealand, and I fell in love with the wine industry. And the combination of the two made me decide that, that I would like to uh, build a new winery and, and get, in, you know, get involved with the industry full time. I grew up on a vineyard in South Australia, so, and I did a degree in agricultural science, majoring in viticulture and plant pathology. So I thought, okay, got a bit of practical and you know, got the paperwork. So I applied and was successful and was the viticulturalist for Montana. And I'd heard about this rather exuberant Irishman and in my head I envisaged a kind of little wiry leprechaunish Irishman. <laughs> And one of the people said to me, have you met Ernie yet? And I said, oh, well, no, I haven't really. And so I kind of looked around for what I thought was Ernie. And there was this very handsome young Irishman over in the corner, nothing about six foot tall, nothing like I'd imagined. So there we are. We knew we had a very high quality wine, but to beat the French and some of the other European winemakers, I didn't think we would have achieved that. Ernie was very good at capturing publicity. Obviously being Irish was an added attraction and I think the local industry used to call him the unofficial ambassador for New Zealand wine because he always did such a good job of talking up the wines and the, and the region. Everyone in the United Kingdom is talking about Marlborough wines at the moment. You know, they, some of the top judges um, are you know, very excited with not only Hunter's wines from Marlborough but some of the other wines coming out of Marlborough. Um, so we can look forward to, I think, a great future with Marlborough wines. Remember Daniel when we got here in 1980, he said to a farmer, I say you mark my words, in 20 years the whole valley will be full of grapes. No, you crazy man. <laughs> and that's when he became the fr crazy Frenchman. <laughs> when I came to Marlborough, it suddenly dawned on me, many of the people who are here are themselves migrants. And today, we are very rich culturally and in many other ways, the, the value that these recent migrants have brought in, not only in terms of business, in terms of their cultural values, in, their, in terms of <clears throat> the colour to the region, and uh, uh, which I never expected when I shifted to Marlborough in '86. I came in New Zealand back in 2014. Um, I'm working as a lab technician at Giesen Winery. So we have different nationalities. They come for harvest and then you become friend and then you become family. Yeah, so we have got like Italian, Argentinian, India. I'm from Nepal, so we got from Greece, South Africa, and of course New Zealanders. And we all are like one group and in a, in a one team and, and a friend and a family. Here at Giesen, we come from all over the world. We love Marlboro. Cheers. Cheers. Is that okay? The whale and me, we met at sea. I chased you through the strait. My aim was true and sent you to your fake and away fate. What's done is done. I fired my gun for crew and skipper loyal. But it was wrong to kill your song for 30 drums of oil. 14 year old Agostino Pirano ran away to sea from his home in Genoa, Italy in 1864. A few years later, he settled in Picton where he set up a fish processing factory for sardines and herrings from nearby Queen Charlotte Sound. The whole family helped, but his son Joseph was after bigger fish, much bigger. Joe Pirano harpooned his first humpback whale in 1911, and the Pirano family hunted whales in Cook Strait for the next 53 years. Singing whale, oh, there she blows just five miles off the shore. In Jimmy's Strait, you met your fate, but we don't do that. 
we loved it. I loved the work. He didn't worry about what conditions were like right because you loved it. Probably the worst part was on these small chases, you get to blow a gale of wind with rain and the wind was say 30 mile an hour. You knew you were going into it at 30 mile an hour and the rain used to hit your cheeks and, and that, that used to hurt. It, it just driving rain into your face. That was probably the worst, worst part of it. I am the third generation Pirano to be involved in the whaling. I served my time as a gunner. When the gun was fired, five seconds later, and the whole lot would explode and kill the whale. See the whale going along, harpoon hitting him, all the rope piling up, and then you'd see boom, and the whale would just roll over stone dead. That no more We won't do That no more We don't do No, we won't do That for sure Whaling ended in December 1964, but the Italian legacy is remembered in Cook Strait place names and at the abandoned remains of the once thriving Pirano Whale Station. Mary Barbara in Venice, we have two boys born in Venice, and we come to visit my in-law in Blenheim. And I saw the fantastic country look like. So look, Barbara, we go back now, we work hard. When we save the money to build the house, we come for good. And we come over for good, and we, we are. Cheers. Unique place, the natural resource that is there. It's just everything. There's no other part of the world that I can offer like I offer here. Peaceful, relaxed, everything is comfortable. You feel comfortable, Evia. Evia, Evia, look. Ah. You know what I do in this one? Because I'm not allowed to catch it. See, I'm a gentle, gentle, and give it a dead. And now I give a dead, give a kiss. And hopla. But New Zealand here is a paradise. Doesn't matter if you don't go fishing for some time and catch a fish, but it's a wonderful day in the sea. And my granddad would say every day passed in the sea is to the dark of the calendar of the life. But we stay young. One day fishing doesn't count on your lifespan. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, born in Switzerland, in Bern to be specific, and uh, we moved to New Zealand in uh, 1997. At, at that time, uh, my wife, who hails from Sweden, and our oldest daughter, who was 11 months old at the time. Yeah. We've been living outside our respective homelands for over 30 years, so over, over half our lives. Uh, you know, we're from where we're from, and a Maori uh, mihi. Then you refer to your um, your mountain and your river, and that's going to be the that's going to be the mountain and the river for the rest of your days, regardless of where you find yourself. I think, or to us, that's the way. Our picton's been good to us, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, we run everything a little bit like a family here, I suppose. That, that goes for um, long-term regulars. They're now bringing back the grandchildren, you know. It all as we as we do, you know. We used to pull up high chairs for them, and now they ask for the high chair for their own kids, and that's kind of neat. Still feeling exactly the same way, both ways, you know. So it grows into a bit of a, bit of a family. My grandparents emigrated from Italy back in 1935, left Vittorio Veneto because of the famine, and Papa came here with a hammer and a nail and started off with nothing. And my father was born here in 1935. You know, he was brought up. You're here in New Zealand, you've got to take every chance that's been given. So we didn't see a lot of him because he was always out in community. By 22, he'd already joined the Air Force 
flow in planes and become New Zealand heavyweight boxing champ. <laughs> and he didn't stop there. His first hotel was the Terminus Hotel in Picton Foreshore. And they'd come in from the freezing works or whatever industry they worked in and we'd sing 10 guitars. There's always guitars playing. And the Terminus just seemed to be like the community hall. He really loved Picton and it seemed like a natural step to run for council. So he had his first term on council at 27 and by 30 he was a mayor. One of the youngest mayors in New Zealand at 30. Absolutely loved the sounds. Used to fish probably far too much down there. It was idyllic. The only thing that was missing was the casino on Mabel Island. He wanted that. He could visualise having beautiful Italian barges going backwards and forwards, helicopters coming in, and he wanted everybody to actually start contributing to the tourism that was that Picton earned. And he certainly felt embraced and that Marlborough was his home, it was his town, and that he was a part of it. Yeah. I was an orphan. Someone bundled me as a, as a bundle put outside uh, the mission hospital. And Mummy was in charge of that uh, hospital. And of course, um, at the end, nobody came, came and claimed me. So Mummy took, took me inside and bath me and feed me and all that. Her name was Annie James. She went to China when she was about 28. There are a lot of uh, missionary nurse amongst them too. Some was a school teacher. But when the communists came, I took over China, because 1949 they declared, see, all the foreigners got expelled from China. Well, Mummy adopted five of us. Looking back, I think Mummy adopted them when she was in her 40s. By the time Mummy adopted me and the next three, it was in her 60s. So when the communists came and she had to leave the country, but she said she won't go un unless New Zealand government allow me to come with her. Although being adopted in China is no official paper to say you're adopted. He says I adopted you and that's it. So the only only way I can come is as in a student visa. So I, so year after year, I had to renew my student visa. We really enjoy living in Blenheim. You yeah. Know, the first Everybody's treating us you know, with such a kindness and, uh, yeah. and uh, so we, uh, all our children's born here yeah. and um, you know, we really enjoy life here in Flanham. Yeah. I had conjured up all these images of New Zealand uh, from what I'd read, what I'd seen in pictures those days uh, and it lived well up to my expectations and I thought it was a land of plenty, green, fresh and clean. That was my first impression. Marvellous. Less people, fresh air, no tar and cement, all that green, oh, absolutely wonderful. Paradise. Most of our friend is the New Zealander and they will come us with their hand, you know potluck party or gin and tonic because they drink a lot and that goes with my husband very well too you know so yes uh, we felt welcome. Well the first impressions of course were that New Zealand <coughs> was somewhere in the vicinity of um, 20 years behind especially in fashions. Um, also that people were actually quite quite different um, on the other hand, of course, the impressive part of Marlborough was at that time the sounds where I was taken by people and I found that the actual Maori population was extremely friendly to me. They didn't care down that I didn't speak very good English <laughs> or hardly any. So I came by myself, Mumbai to Sydney, Sydney to Auckland. Especially scared because I can't speak any English. How can I go to the different country by myself, you know? That's what is me, but God lead us, lead me to. I went there and we get talking. She interviewed me so many questions. And out of the blue, she asked me, 
Do Thai people eat dog? And I quite shocked with that question. I never come across that, that kind of question before. And then I look at her and I just deny it. I said, no way, Thai people don't eat dog. And then I look at her dogs and I said, but your dogs look very yummy to me. And after that, she, I never get invited back to her house. <laughs> I'm from Belarus. My dad was officer of the Russian Air Force. I have the university degree as uh, electrical engineering and I did the research and work in university and uh, later I start work in the college as a teacher. I taught the, my students the electrical subjects and I came in Belena because my diploma it's not acceptable in New Zealand. What I should do? I start work as a nanny. And I found the luck here in Blenheim. I found the luck, I found the job. I go here in the stadium to the swimming pool too. And I like to go to the sauna and swimming pool too. This is part of Belarus too. <laughs> yeah, I just, just for, I feeling very relaxing here, very comfortable in Marlborough, in Marlborough. When we started making shoes, we made the Diana shoe, which Princess Diana was wearing. So we copied those shoes, and there was no end to them. Hannah's just bought thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Everybody was wearing Princess Di shoes. It got bigger and bigger and bigger, and we had to have bigger premises. So that's when we bought the land on the corner of Taylor Pass Road and Wither Road. A couple of months later, we were employing up to 80 people. And that was really the highlight, because after that, the shoe trade as the textile trade went down the tubes, because that was when we got the global economy and rotonomics. I never thought I'm going to meet one of my husband. <laughs> but yeah, we did it like that. And, um... I came 24th of December. We got married on the 12th of January. I'm so blessed in the Marlborough. Same house. I never moved anywhere. Same house, 36 years. <laughs> when I had the girls, the triplet, um, some people say, oh, now you are special because you have triplet. But it's not true. I'm special before that anyway. Not special need. <laughs> but special. Um, then people told me that, oh, now you have triplet, you become famous, but it's not true. You know, um, people know me because of me, not because, because I have the girls. Yeah, so. I like Blenheim. The day we came, food is in there. Take the children, pick your own food. You eat some of them. All the stain on the clothes, you eat more than you pick. And those good, there's a variety, like a variety of people now here, different multicultural group, and we had a variety of fruit too. I shifted to Marlborough in 86. One of three migrants here, as far as I knew. Of course, as Indians in Sri Lanka, we stood out. And today, of course, you look and see so many different races, religions, color, and it makes it a multicultural melting pot, which is wonderful to see. Like a family, we all together one family. We used to so close each other, Tongans, Filipinos, Indians, Europeans, English, Germans, all Germans, so many at that time and lots of people died, but we are very close to each other. Yeah, we are 
immigrants and we always love our country but I do find here in Marlboro and lovely climate and green and snow and uh, rivers uh, and wonderful people and uh, yeah I count the Marlboro is my second home. So my name is Honza, I'm from Prague, Czech Republic, so the other side of the world. I have been here about 14 years, I would say, roughly, in Marlboro. I came to New Zealand with $50, which I used on a ferry from Wellington to, you know, Picton, and that's how I started, you know, I lived under a tree <laughs> for three months. I first arrived in Picton and just seeing those palm trees and this beautiful port town, it was, it was just kind of magic, you know, it was very beautiful. And um, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, that was the first really good impression of that country, I guess. I met my partner here in Blenheim. He was working at Backpackers and he managed to get his um, work visa. So he wanted to stay in New Zealand and um, I liked him so much that I thought, why not, I'll stay here with him as well. Yeah. <laughs> He's from Wales, so it actually really handy because we live like Netherlands and Wales. It's not a very long flight. So my mom was like, oh, that's all right. He's from Wales. That's OK. We can cope with that. And then I had to explain to my mom that uh, he wanted to stay in New Zealand. So yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> it was a totally different place for me. I mean, different culture, everything. But people here, like, they're really um, friendly. So that's why I'm still here, you know. One of the first impressions that I have uh, from Blenheim, I think, and the Marborians in general, um, was uh, the welcoming uh, that I had, that I, that, I mean, how welcome I, I, I felt when I went to the library. Because everyone was just like, uh, oh, you need to do this, you need to go there, you need to do that, and you need to, and I'd go, wow, okay, yes, and, and, oh, no. and, and they don't gave me directions, they actually came out and, look, come, let me show you. So that was really a, a, a very good impression also. When you're visiting, it's quite different. So you, when you're visiting your visitors, you enjoy your scenery, you don't look at people's real life. But when you started to to live somewhere, this day-to-day -day life, it is a shock to me. I was completely shocked because I come from a country where, where there's 20 million people from just one city, New Delhi. And then when I came to Queenstown, I was completely shocked. There was no one around after 8 p.m. Traffic in Manila is really bad. Uh, and so when we came here, you know, that was one of the things that immediately I sort of observed, you know. Five minutes, people already say that's traffic, but in the Philippines, hours. People will invite us for, you know, a barbecue at three o'clock. I'm like, oh, what it is? Is it a late lunch? Is it an early dinner? You know, <laughs> I still struggle with that. I still have my French habits of, you know, having dinner at eight o'clock in the evening, which is really late. While I was graduating hospitality and hotel management in India, I was so keen to launch a career in a country which is peace, safe, friendly nation, and most importantly, English-speaking country. And so eventually I found New Zealand would be the country I wanted to move in to pursue my career and to live for my dream life. Mm, one more. Mm, good work, okay. When I try and describe the feeling of immigrating, it's like you've got your bucket and you fill that with everything you love that gives you energy, but it feels a bit like you've got a hole in your bucket. It leaks your bucket if you're away from your family or your friends. So to me, it feels that after a year or a year and a half or two years, you start to feel that it's sipping away all that energy and you feel like you want to go home to fill your your bucket again and I think that's difficult that, that you can't explain to people that yes I'm very happy here and yes I'm very happy with my partner I'm very happy with my work 
where I live. But being away, far away from your family, you can't go to them and you can't go to your friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I didn't expect that. It's hard. It's really hard. You know, I need to go back to look after dead. Um, dead is 19 years old. It's a Chinese. It's our tradition. Sorry, <laughs> become never emotional. I need to do it as a daughter. And I've been away for so long, but the thinking about living here, um, even temporarily, probably I will come back again. It's quite big for me. It's a home. You ho I got friends, family, um, so that it's a home. It's hard. I think it's always hard when you move one country to another country and everything is so new. Um, the food, environment, culture and people, of course, yeah. Um, but after a couple of years, I found it's a bit easier, like, you know, just find more something that you're interested to do and you make more friends and go out and about and meet some new new people and join with groups and stuff like that. So it's very helpful for people just come into a different country. That difficult aspect of integrating, that is, a that is a very difficult journey. Being a foreigner is not an easy thing. You always miss home. No matter what, you always miss home. We try to support each other as much as we can. Um, but uh, I think as a family, it's it's hard. Sometimes it's hard because we don't have any family around. And um, I think it's, it's a bit hard sometimes to not have, you know, um, the grandparents just next door to take care of your kids or having, you know, aunties and, you know, around. Because sometimes you, you want to share, you know, some of your daily life with them and you can't. And even if you have Skype and WhatsApp and Facebook, and uh, it's still virtual, you know. When I came here in year nine, I faced a lot of bullying and stuff, you know, for who I was. And there was people who supported me. Yeah, boxing helped me and helped me a lot. And I won the South Island title in my weight category. I kind of aim to be one of the best in NZ in lightweight category once, one day. Maybe even represent NZ in Commonwealth. We'll see how it goes, you know. It's amazing here, actually, that uh, and it, all these people made it made it work here. You know, all these people usually are successful. You had to leave your comfort zone. You know, you have to leave your comfort back back home. You came here and you studied, even with your degrees. A lot of people studied at the bottom. So I go to my um, bachelor degree and I did my master degree, and I tried to apply for so many jobs. Now I never heard a thing. <laughs> Then I start to lower my expectation to apply for the daily jobs and I get replies that you're over, overqualified. That's very frustrating for, for me. I would think I would have something to contribute, you know, and make my, my life worthwhile here. The first thing I say is, you're here, you have to respect the rules. You're here, you have to start to thinking about the learning English because the government is going to pay you to learn, not to lie down watching TV, just to learn. And then that is going to be an investment for you to go and find a job. When you find a job, you can be able to buy your own stuff and you are going to be able to buy your house or to rent something else or do something for your children, for education of your children because as South American, we like to have the children, we have to raise our children, and we have to, they can be educated, not become us. They can to be something else. Language is culture and the other way around. You cannot learn language without, uh, I mean, there is no language. In a, it, 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 language cannot, does not exist in a void, in a cultural void. I love the Maori language. It's very similar to my language very, very similar. Even the numbers, they say their numbers, they're similar to mine. When we say, they say Tahiru, Watoru, Fa, Rima, Ono, Fitu, we say in my dialect, Sayu, Dua, Tulu, Upat, Lima, Ono, Fitu. In Tagalog, it's at the Loa, Tatlo, Apat, Lima, Anim, Fitu. So it's so, so close. You know, the, the Fano, so here, like the Fano and the Iwi, Hapu and all that, we have the same thing. 
in the Philippines, and I, I'm sure in other sort of um, cultures as well. But we do have that extended family, and we do take care of our family, even when we have our um, funerals, for example. We want you know, to have a funeral in our homes or in our community, which is similar to Amarai here in, in, um, you know, in New Zealand. The first funeral I've been in, and I was waiting, waiting, um, when is the funeral? And then they said to me, well, it's happened. I said, how? Like everybody's laughing and they're drinking and everybody dressed well and makeup and all these things. I didn't see them happy. To the limit, I said, are they happy he's died? So everybody started laughing. But then I feel in my culture that we are sad so much that he left. But we never remember the great things he's done in his life. And in New Zealand, it's fully different. And again, it's different between Kiwi and Maori. So I've been, you know, thankful and I'm grateful that I've been with these people in their special or um, serious time, let me say, um, because it's open for me another door of life. Um, not everyone acts the same. The community. It's very helpful. I never felt as an outsider, as a foreigner, you know, at all. Uh, on the contrary, very welcome everywhere. So, uh, yeah, so I just made it my, my home and for my family, for my kids, yeah. But I have, like, more other friends from other nationalities as well. So, um, like, you know, it doesn't matter if I have Nepalese friend or a friend from Argentina. Like, I'm, they are like a friend. And then friend doesn't have a nationality, you know, or doesn't have a, any race. Kapaka has been a really important part of my life, teaching me about this really lovely culture. Growing up, I was really confused because my parents were from the top part of India and they moved up to the capital when I was getting born. I have no idea about my culture there and I felt like I lost it. I have two languages that my parents speak, but I can only speak one of them. I feel bad, but this culture gave me a hope, something powerful. When I'm on the stage doing haka, I feel really proud. I feel the energy. And kapaka has been a really important part of my life. So I said, okay. One time I said, I have to go to the Maori group because I love to sing their Maori songs and I love to do their dancing. And they sang Hokari Kariana. So we sang it. Every morning when I wake up, I light a little candle and say a small prayer. And it's nice going to the temple uh, and praying in a temple because there's nice vibration there and lots of prayers and, you know, people have been coming there. But in Hinduism, you can pray anyway. You don't have to go to the temple. Me, as a Muslim, I never faced any, any difficulties or never been ignored or rejected particularly whole Muslim community in Blenheim, uh, which is really small here. And we get on very well each other and we spend time sometimes together to celebrate our Eid celebrations. We never differentiate Christian, Muslim or, or Hinduism like Krishna, Hare Krishna, you know. And I had a little altar in one of the corner and I always pray there. You know, I, go, I met people who was Jehovah's. I met with people who was restrict Catholic. Um, and Margaret Weston is a Catholic. Um, I met with people. Um, they are Christian, but they are from the Middle East. I met from people Catholic from Japan, but everyone have his different way of inter interpretation to the religion, which I find. In the end of the day, they all sit in the same basic point, which is do the things which you are sure that you're going to help yourself and you help the one in front of you to grow. Uh, 
I'm so blessed and I'm so glad to be here in Marlborough. And the people I see from Marlborough, uh, even if at work, gym, outside, church, mosque, anywhere, are incredibly amazing. Always they been there for me and I feel like I've been welcomed by each and every one of them. They really helped me make this place home. You could have a big house, a big car, you know, you can have all the money in the world. But sometimes all these things are not important, you know, the material things are not important in life, you know. It's, it's peace of mind, it's your happiness, it's contentment. And the place where you feel happy is more important than, than all these, you know, material things. Family is the core of any society and it's important to maintain family values in order to add value to others. You can choose, you can choose how to, not only to get to know about the Kiwi culture, but it's a fantastic opportunity for you to keep doing that, sharing your culture, because you need to do that. So share, be aware of what is there, learn and uh, integrate. That's basically it. Hey, making a new place your home, but doesn't mean that I will forget my culture. It's something that makes me who I am. And I want you to remember who you are. Remember where you come from. Remember what your language is. Remember your EV. Remember who you are. And that's what makes you you. I played my guitar in 1985, the first time I played the guitar in church. And I'm still doing it. So I've been accepted. I'm a local now. <laughs>
বেনামে এসেছিলাম উনিশশো সাতাশি নমস্কার মাই মার বড় একদম মন পড়ছ মহা কাম করছু For over a thousand years, Marlborough has offered all who come here a place to call home, opportunity to grow and the space to be brilliant. Every migrant, past or present, has added to the colour and diversity of this place. And who knows what a future Marlborough might look like. It will still be a place of sun, space and opportunity. All the richer for the myriad of places that Mulberryans have come from. Because we're all immigrants here and there are many great stories still to be told.